What's up, YouTube? This is Corey from The Overlook, and we go over the books that you may have overlooked. So, we have been given a lot of thought to the series that we're going to cover next, now that we finished up with the number of stories that we were working on. Uh, we got some recommendations, and we took those and some current events into consideration. Uh, Quicksilver has been trending, so at first I thought it would be perfect to cover his series. But then I thought, why just cover Quicksilver when I can cover all the X-Men? A lot of people know that Hank McCoy, the Beast, brought the original five teenage X-Men to the future. But what some people don't know is how they got back home. 20 years from now, a person, hidden by a cloak, walks up to the front steps of the Xavier Institute for Mutant Education and Outreach within Central Park, New York. The mansion is in ruins. The bodies of X-Men and young students litter the area, more than one would expect. Some of them are hidden by scattered debris and clouds of smoke from the dying fires. The cloaked person kneels down and examines one of the heroes. None of this is right, they think. Everything is screwed up, and it's that old bastard's fault. The cloaked person opens up a portal and walks in, vowing that it is up to them to clean up this mess. In the present day, more specifically, in Chicago, Illinois, an anti-mutant rally is currently taking place. The angry masses hold up their signs in protest. No more mutants. Their curses and confidence grow louder by the minute. All the while, two small children, siblings, hide away within an alley. They sink into the shadows, afraid to show their faces, believing full well that the protesters will kill the two of them if they are found. The protesters do find the children and begin to converge on the alley. The children plead for mercy, but they only know French. The kids cannot begin to convey their thoughts or understand the words the protesters are saying. Of course, the protesters take this personally. That's when the X-Men arrive. Bobby Drake, Iceman, Scott Summers, Cyclops, Jean Grey, Marvel Girl, Warren Worthington III, Angel, and Hank McCoy, Beast, along with an alternate dimension, Aurora Monroe, known as Bloodstorm. Marvel Girl telepathically reaches out to the children, telling them not to be afraid. The X-Men are here to help them, and they have more friends who can help. The X-Men bring the children back to the Institute within Central Park. The Headmaster, Kitty Pride, is skeptical about the two at best. It certainly doesn't help their case when Marvel Girl tells her that she already poked through the kids memories with their permission of course and they don't know who their parents are they have no memories beyond today and they're French like France French the kids aren't even sure how they ended up in Chicago their memories started only a few moments before the team found them Marvel Girl concludes that someone may have wiped the children's mind, and whoever did it, if someone did, they did a great job. Normally, there would still be a trace, a fragment or two, and yet Marvel Girl can't find anything. Ultimately, with no lead to go on, Kitty decides to leave the children in the care of Dr. Cecilia Reyes for now. She tells Marvel Girl, that if they find any lead on the kids or their parents, she'll reach out. For now, they just have to wait. Later, Cyclops takes Bloodstorm to get some food at a local Thai restaurant. Even though Bloodstorm is a vampire, 
and there is literally nothing she can eat that they can order. A slight oversight on Scott's part. He stammers bashfully in order to get his thoughts together. He tells her that he actually invited her out to speak about something, but Bloodstorm has already pieced it together. She is aware that there is an attraction between the two of them. As she puts it, they are just a couple of people displaced from their time, their home universe, who met here, in this one. It's best if they put the future and the past out of their minds and just focus on now. At that moment, Ahab and his hound burst through the window. Rory Campbell in the future of 811 becomes the hunter known as Ahab. He was commissioned to track down and capture mutants, which led to the creation of his mutant hounds. Ahab's greatest hound creation was Rachel Summers, the telepathic daughter of Earth 811 Cyclops and Jean Grey. The screams of innocent people echo through the air, bouncing off the dancing shards of glass. Ahab pays them no mind. He looks down towards Scott before raising his harpoon and telling him, Good evening, Cyclops. My, you are as young as they say. Much younger than the last time we met. Not much more than a baby. Bring him to me my hounds. This Scott has never seen Ahab before in his life, but he has no time to think. As one of the hounds leaps at Scott, its claws sharpen and ready to attack, Cyclops diverts it with a blast of optic energy. The hero then prepares to turn his focus on the pirate. Before he can, the second hound attacks and pins him to the ground. Bloodstorm rushes forth and hits the hound off of Cyclops, telling him it may finally be time to admit that they make a great team. As she leans forward to help Cyclops to his feet, Ahab pierces Bloodstorm with his harpoon. Blood flies in every direction as Ahab lifts Bloodstorm up. Her screams in agony scratch the air until she is out of breath and out of life. Cyclops bellows out her name, and Ahab just chuckles. A vampire mutant. I had my harpoon laced with silver for such occasions. The future is lousy with them. The worst of two worlds. Tears begin to roll down Cyclops' face. Ahab tells the hero that he needn't worry. He will be joining the girl soon enough. Once again, he releases the chains holding the bloodhounds and they run bloodthirsty, drooling on all fours in Scott's direction. But he has had enough. Cyclops rips off his scarlet glasses and suddenly the whole room is painted red. He unleashes his optic blast at full power attempting to end the battle in one blow. The attack blows up the restaurant and throws both Ahab and his hounds out onto the street. Ahab looks up at the boy, confused. It seems that Cyclops is more advanced in his training than Ahab anticipated. He is something more than the child he is supposed to be. Ahab vows to not make the same mistake twice before teleporting him and his hounds away in a blue flash of light. Cyclops tries to stop the villain from running by shooting another one of his optic blasts, but he barely misses. He yells in the sky for the coward to come back, to come back and fight him. But no one answers him. Cyclops stands alone, surrounded only by roaring flames, ash, and a few brave pedestrians flashing photos with their phones. The hero returns to the restaurant to mourn and retrieve his fallen teammate's body, and then makes a mental call out to Marvel Girl. He tells her what happened, 
and she quickly reaches out to the rest of the team. It's a code blue. At the moment, Bobby is watching a play on Broadway. He begrudgingly stands from his seat and squeezes his way out the aisle to make his exit. He then makes his eyes slide and begins to make his way to the Institute. All the while, Iceman is being watched. The cloaked man from a nearby rooftop lifts his rifle and aims it down the street. Bobby hardly makes it a block away from the theater before being shot in transit. A barrage of bullets fly through the air and Iceman barely has time to react. He raises his hands to create an ice shield and huddles behind it. The blasts of energy chipping away at the shield as they hit. One blast hits the center of the shield and throws Iceman off his slide and into a nearby clothing store. Iceman rolls into a rack of clothes and desperately attempts to rip the clothes away to regain his composure. However, when Iceman looks up, he finds Nathan Summers, also known as Cable, holding out a hand to help. At that moment, more blasts of energy rain from the sky and begin destroying the store. Cable tries to convince Iceman to try to escape, but Bobby refuses to leave him. Iceman creates a number of duplicate ice golems to try to distract their attacker, but he is hit with a taser chip that incapacitates him. Bobby reels back in pain and begins to writhe on the floor as the cloaked man approaches. Scott storms through the front doors of the Xavier Institute. Jean runs to him, frantically apologizing. Out of all of them, him and Bloodstorm were the closest. But Scott pays her no mind. He has one priority, finding Rachel Gray. He knows she can hear him. He calls out her name and sends out a mental calling ordering her to show herself. Rachel, yet another of the time-displaced children of Scott Summers and Jean Grey, arrives and asks Scott, what is going on? Scott tells Rachel that Bloodstorm was killed by some sort of techno-pirate with a peg leg and a spear who had two hounds with him. And the hounds had stripes on their faces, just like Rachel. Rachel explains to the young Jean Grey and Scott that the man's name is Ahab, and he's the one who turned her into a hound. He kept her prisoner, tortured her, forced her to hunt down other mutants. Rachel tells the two that Ahab's appearance certainly explains the return of her facial markings. But that doesn't matter. All Scott wants to know is how to find him. At that moment, Hank arrives and asks his teammates if they're talking about Bobby. He explains that Iceman hasn't checked in yet and isn't answering any calls. Hopefully, he's okay. Elsewhere, within the clothing store, Cable ducks for cover behind a pillar and tells Iceman that everything is going to be okay. Bobby continues to worm on the ground, incapacitated by the electrical current constricting his body. When Cable reaches to remove the tasing device, he is shot point blank by a blast from the shooter's gun. Cable flies backwards and craters the wall on contact. The person in the cloak tells Cable that he's too slow now, too old and too slow. All of this is his fault. Everything happening now is because Cable neglected to do his duty. Cable tells the person in the cloak that they're wrong before grabbing a handful of clothes off the ground and tossing them into the air, blinding his opponent. 
Cable then rushes the gunman, tackling him to the ground, saying that they needed the kids to see. They needed to see what they became so they could go back with the knowledge and be better. So they could be better. It was a risk worth taking. Back within the Institute, the time-displaced X-Men, Cyclops, Marvel Girl, Beast, Angel, as well as Rachel Gray and Kitty Pride, use Cerebro in their efforts to locate Iceman. Marvel Girl tries to focus, but no matter how hard she tries, she cannot find Bobby anywhere. For a moment there was a blip, then nothing. It's like he went offline. She just can't see him anymore. But it isn't just Iceman. There are two others, and they both seem to have some sort of psychic shield. It takes a bit more effort, but Marvel Girl soon realizes one of the two is Cable. Beast convinces Marvel Girl to attempt to see through Cable's eyes. Perhaps then, she will be able to see what is blocking her from locating Iceman. Another difficult task for the young hero. Marvel Girl knows all too well that Cable is not usually receptive to other psychic influence, but she will have to succeed nonetheless. Back within the store, Cable throws the gunman's rifle aside and attempts to attack his opponent. The gunman sneakily pulls a pistol out of his holster and shoots Cable point blank in his ribcage. Cable recoils backwards and falls to the floor. He then attempts to crawl to the discarded rifle. The cloaked person slowly stands to their feet before walking over to the rifle and picking it up, easily removing it from Cable's reach. Listen to you, the cloaked person tells him, rationalizing your failure. Look at you. You got old, soft, weak. You've outlived your usefulness. The cloaked person then points their weapon at Cable and pulls the trigger, declaring, Cable, you're relieved of your duty. Cable is riddled with blasts of energy. The pain of the holes being punched in his body is immeasurable. His mind goes into shock causing a psychic feedback to rush back to Marvel Girl like a flood of water spilling out from a broken dam. Jean cries out in pain as she tries to rip Cerebro from her head. Flashes of pink psychic energy whip across the room causing the other X-Men to duck and cover. Then, within an instant, it's over and Marvel Girl falls to the ground. Scott kneels down to help her to her feet and she tells him, it's Cable. He's dead. In the store, the cloaked person throws down their rifle, telling Cable that the old fool really should have seen this coming. They then walk over to the body of Iceman. The hero lay there, unconscious. The taser device that was shot into his neck still crackling with its electrical current. The cloaked person then picks up Iceman and throws him over their shoulder. Body slide, bite two, they mutter before the blue portal breaks the stillness in front of them. The cloaked person then walks into the portal and disappears in thin air. Later, the X-Men find Cable's lifeless body in the middle of the wreckage that is the clothing store. The young Jean Grey has to avert her eyes. Her relationship with Cable is difficult to epitomize, but nevertheless, they were connected. Rachel, on the other hand, runs to hug Cable. Before she was Rachel Gray, she was Rachel Summers, his alternate dimensional sister. Cyclops kneels down to mourn his future would-be son and asks Rachel if this is the work of Ahab.
Rachel cannot say that it is. If it were Ahab, she would be able to sense him. But this isn't his work. This feels different. Suddenly, current day Jean Grey and Nightcrawler arrive, teleporting in out of a plume of smoke. Jean reaches out to comfort her younger self, telling Marvel Girl that she could hear her psychic scream from the X-Men Red Base 3,000 feet under the ocean. They came as quickly as they could. Jean then sees Cable. She has had many run-ins with her alternate dimensional son, and she gives him a second of silence. Jean then tells the children that whoever did this, whoever killed her son, will pay for it. The current day Jean's power dwarfs her younger counterpart and she informs the team that the person, the man, who did this was using a psi shield. So, they're smart enough to know to protect themselves from Jean and her younger self. But, that doesn't mean they can't find them. Jean tracked Iceman back to this store, but his trail ends there. So, Jean announces, they're dealing with a teleporter. Cyclops steps forward and tells the woman that Ahab was also using teleportation technology, concluding that this must be his doing. However, something within Rachel causes her to object. She still doesn't believe that this is the work of Ahab. Elsewhere, in an undisclosed location, a stasis chamber hisses as it closes over the still sleeping body of Bobby Drake. The cloaked man places his hand on the chamber and admires his work. One down, he hums as he removes his hood and walks over to a nearby computer panel. He presses a number of keys and X's out an Intel display with Iceman's picture on it. He then stares for a moment of the pictures of the other displaced teenagers, Beast, Marvel Girl, Angel, and Cyclops. Four to go. It's almost sunset. Cyclops sits on the front steps of the Xavier Institute for Mutant Education and Outreach, which now resides within Central Park, and watches as a couple of young kids play baseball. For the kids, at least, life is simple. Jean Grey asks to join him, but he rejects her offer, stating that he would like to be left alone. She doesn't listen. She says she isn't going to intrude, but she also isn't going to leave him alone. A torrent of emotion pours out of Scott. He asks Jean how she can possibly stay so calm. Bloodstorm and Cable are dead. And what happened to Bloodstorm was because of him. And they still don't know where Bobby is. This is what they have been fighting against for their entire lives. And now, here they are in the future where they should have already made a difference and nothing's changed. They're still fighting, only now they're dying. Later, Headmaster Kitty Pride makes a call out for all three X-Men teams, Red, Blue, and Gold, as well as X-Force to report to her office for further discussion on the ongoing events. Shatterstar is the last to join the meeting, and when he does, Kitty begins. In the last 24 hours, two X-Men have been killed. Iceman, young Bobby Drake, is missing and they can only hope that he's still alive. The older Iceman reasons that if his younger counterpart were dead, he would be gone as well, citing 
When the kids first came to the future, young Cyclops died. It may have been less than a minute, but even still, the adult Scott vanished like he were never there. So, it only stands to reason that if he's still here, then so is younger Bobby. Beast counters that the younger X-Men have significantly altered the timeline since their stay in the present. Who is to say that any changes done to them now will still affect their older counterparts? Kate reorganizes the team's focus by setting a timeline of events. All they know at this point is that Ahab claimed he was here for Scott, and then later, Bobby went missing. At the same time, Cable's killed by someone else, someone possibly working for Ahab. Domino, Warpath, and Shatterstar of the X-Force are the first to call for vengeance. Cable was a mentor to more of them than not. Rachel Summers, however, tells them it won't be so easy. Rachel reminds the team that Ahab can time travel. Right now, he could be hiding in another year, another century, which would explain why he had Cable killed. The one person who would have been able to track Ahab through time. And if he's also here for the kids, it's only because their deaths mean something bad, something terrible for mutant kind and its future. Rachel's already seen the future Ahab wants. She should have known that he was coming when she started to change, when her hound markings started to return. Rachel tells the rest of the mutants that they need to do everything in their power to stop Ahab. They have to protect young Scott, Jean, Hank, and Warren like their lives depend on it. Because they very well may. Kitty seconds the notion by proposing that they split into four teams. Each team will take one of the remaining original five back to their base and protect them. If they split the children up, make it harder to find, then they can buy themselves the time they need to find Ahab while keeping the kids safe. Cyclops stands to his feet and storms out of the room without saying a word. He rushes all the way outside, where it is now storming. Warren tries to stop him, but Scott has no intention of being babysat. He argues that Ahab is out there trying to kill them, and Kate and the rest of the X-Men are just trying to take them off the board and stuff them into little hidey holes. This is their fight, theirs, and Bobby needs them. Without Bobby, they can't go back. None of this will work if it's not all of them. Warren tries to get a word in edgewise, but fails to do so. Jean, on the other hand, her mind is elsewhere. She tells the two men to be quiet and listen, something's wrong. She can feel it. Someone is watching them. At that moment, a tranquilizer dart hits Angel in the neck. The dart lets out an electric shock that brings his movements to a halt and he falls to the soaked ground, senseless and paralyzed. Cyclops is quick to turn on his visor. It now glows bright with the energy of Sidorak, and he demands that the coward Ahab show himself. Beast takes a more pragmatic approach. He kneels down to inspect their fallen ally. When he can't get a read, he turns to Marvel Girl, and in order to have her check Warren's mind, he calls out. But before he can, he is shot in the neck. Beast wavers back and forth as the venom in the tranquilizer dart begins to take effect. Marvel Girl attempts to keep him on his feet, but within seconds, Beast is knocked out cold. Cyclops sprints off into the park while Marvel Girl attends to both their allies and scans the area once again for their attacker. 
She can't necessarily see him, but she can sense a void. There should be something, but there isn't. Realizing that this is the Psyche shield her older counterpart previously mentioned, Marvel Girl makes a mental connection with Cyclops and directs him towards the void. Cyclops fires an optic blast into the thicket of trees. The beam hits one of the trees causing it to explode into flames. As it does, the shooter dives out from his cover to protect himself. Cyclops charges the enemy and tackles him to the ground. Raising a fist and pulling back the shooter's cloak, shouting that he will kill the man for what he did. The roar of the flames do little to burn out the sound of the boy's rage. That is, until Cyclops realizes that the shooter is Cable. Albeit a younger version, but still Cable. The sight causes Cyclops to hesitate, giving Cable an opportunity to distance himself and run away. The rain continues to pour. Cable reaches the unconscious angel and turns his attention on Beast. Marvel Girl steps forward, indignant. Bands of pink telekinetic energy begin to spiral around her clenched and trembling fists. She orders the young Cable to stop what he's doing, giving him to the count of three to explain himself. No, no talking, Cable tells her. You can't be here. You've been told. You already know. And still, you're here. The time for talking has long since passed. Cable grabs Angel and says, Body slide by two, creating another blue vortex of energy that successfully teleports him away. Soon after, the remainder of the X-Men arrive to aid the young heroes. Marvel Girl informs Kitty Pride and the others that it was a young Cable that attacked them, which results in Kitty calling for an evac. Her decision is to move the kids as far away from the school as possible. The older Jean Grey, leader of the X-Men Red Division, invites her younger counterpart to join her and her team in the undersea base, Cerebro. But Marvel Girl refuses. She wants to go with X-Force. Later, a young beast wakes up in the medical wing in his older counterpart's care. The older Hank McCoy fills in the younger one with all the up-to-date information. He has come to the conclusion that if Cable is going as far as attacking them on their own front lawn, while more than a dozen X-Men were sitting feet away, he's desperate. Hank knows Cable. Well, the older Cable. And he's a brilliant mind for military tactics. He would never stage an attack like today's unless he was desperate. When Angel came to the future with the rest of the X-Men, he found out he was destined to become a horseman of the apocalypse. He rejected that destiny. When Angel came in contact with the Black Vortex, which granted him and a number of others cosmically enhanced powers, his wings were made anew. Mechanical still, but this time they could conjure flaming weapons fly faster than the speed of light, and shoot energy bursts. Surely, he believed, he will reject the binds of destiny. It was a conscious decision that he made. So, Cable decides, this is what Warren deserves. Cable binds Angel's hands and feet with steel chains while using a mechanical device to brace and grip his wings. He then flips a switch that turns on a buzzsaw, and Cable watches as the machine rips Warren's wings right out of his back. Back at the mansion, Old Man Logan is second-guessing Kitty's decision to separate the team. Before she can defend her position, the school is attacked 
With an explosion, the front door and windows shatter apart. Dozens of mutant hunting hounds leap through the building. They scratch and claw at the unexpecting children and quickly begin to overtake the area. Ahab holds up his harpoon and cackles. You think you can just hide the young X-Men from me? That Ahab, the Houndmaster, wouldn't come directly to you and snatch them directly from your grasp. Rachel watches the destruction unfold and is at a loss of words. It's really him. She snaps and torpedoes towards Ahab. Not again, she says. He made a mistake coming to the school. She vows to Ahab that she is going to make sure the monster regrets it. Ahab launches his harpoon at Rachel and it sinks into her shoulder before throwing her off course and crashing to the floor. Monster? He spits. That's rich. Coming from one of the most notoriously bloodthirsty hounds. Tell me, Rachel, do your friends know how many of their kind you killed in your time? Do they know how much joy you took from it? How you lapped up the blood of the other mutants and begged for more. Beast turns to help Rachel amongst the chaos and Ahab tells him, I have no interest in killing Rachel. It does me no good. Gives me no advantage. Not like killing you. No, don't worry about Rachel. She'll survive. It's my other hounds you should worry about. Calvin Rankin was born in Passaic, New Jersey. He goes by Mimic. After an accidental mix-up of chemicals from his father Ronald Rankin's experiments, he gained the ability to temporarily copy the skills, physical traits, knowledge, and superpowers of any person within close range. Due to the long time spent with the original five X-Men, Calvin is able to call on any of their powers at will. Thus, he has the powers for flight granted by Angel the increased strength and agility of Beast, the optic blasts of Cyclops, the temperature manipulation of Iceman, and the telekinesis of Jean Grey. Currently, Calvin is grocery shopping. He lives the simple life now. But no matter how far he distances himself from the super heroics, Calvin's abilities will always be valuable. And at the moment, that statement is especially true for Cable, who arrives at the grocery store, tracks down Calvin, and shoots him with the same incapacitating bullets that he did to both the young Iceman and Beast. Your services are required, Cable tells him. Back at the Institute, Old Man Logan has been transformed into one of Ahab's hounds. He growls as he slowly approaches the young Hank McCoy and Rachel Summers. Hank tries to reason with him, but Logan doesn't listen. He only heeds his new master's call. Get this beast, hound. Tear him to shreds for your master, says Ahab. Elsewhere, in Cerebro, 3,000 feet below the ocean surface, the younger Cyclops watches it all. He pleads for the older Jean Grey to let him return to the mansion at once, but she refuses. Jean and the rest of X-Men Red, at least the ones in attendance, Nightcrawler, 
the Wolverine named Laura Kinney, and her clone, Gabby. Apparently, her name is Honey Badger. All made a promise to protect Scott, no matter what happens. Elsewhere, in the X-Wing, 30,000 feet above New Jersey, Marvel Girl is being escorted by the X-Force. Or rather, she has nominated herself to be part of the team during this expedition. The X-Force's orders are to keep Marvel Girl as far away from Ahab as possible. But Marvel Girl's read each of their minds and she knows they have a hidden agenda. They're looking for Cable, the young Cable. And they're looking for answers. Well, she wants answers too. In the mansion, old man Logan lets out a roar before lunging in for an attack. Suddenly, the older beast arrives. He jumps in front of Logan's claws and they slice right across his rib cage. Beast tells his younger counterpart to run as far as he can to get somewhere safe while he deals with this. The younger Hank scrambles to his feet and sprints down the hallway. Beast takes his try to reason with old man Logan to snap out of it, but he too fails. Ahab just stands there and smiles as he watches Logan attempt to plunge his claws into Beast's chest. Once Ahab, master of the hounds, has his hooks into a fresh new hound, he doesn't let go. Especially not when it comes to ones who bring as much to the table as Logan does. Ahab then signals for the two French children to join him at his side. It was him who dropped the children off in Chicago for the young X-Men to save. Such noble heroes, trampling on themselves for the opportunity to save those in need. It was so easy that this victory barely feels fairly won. The boy, Maxime, has the adept ability at manipulating those around him, handy for keeping people calm while little Mannion implants her psychic bombs, hiding them deep in one's brain. No need for years of torture when Ahab can simply implant several years worth of memories of it. Like an anesthesiologist and a surgeon, they work quite well together, creating hounds in an instant. It's really quite spectacular. At that moment, Iceman glides in shooting icicle daggers at the Houndmaster. Bobby asks Ahab what he did with his younger counterpart. Ahab easily hits him out of the air, telling Bobby that he has no idea what he's talking about. Storm also joins the fight. She flies and summons a lightning to take down Logan in an instant. She then tells Beast to go find and help his younger self. She will have to fight Ahab alone. Ahab demands that she hand over the young Hank McCoy, stating, if I can't have young Beast, then maybe another. My hounds are everywhere and can be activated with simply a snap of a finger. Suddenly, within Cerebro, Nightcrawler goes mad. He puts both his hands to his head in a desperate attempt to fight off what is happening. But it's all for naught. Blood red hound markings begin to appear on his body. Then, in an instant, he teleports to the young Scott Summers, grabs him, and teleports away. Elsewhere, on the X Jet, Shatterstar begins to transform as well. With a gnash of his teeth, he produces 
his Tekokagi fist weapons and begins to stab for the young Jean Grey. In Sea Rebro, it is all hands on deck as Wolverine and Jean Grey begin looking for Scott. Wolverine, with her heightened sense of smell and hearing, Jean, with her telepathic prowess. But it is Honey Badger that finds him. She innocently points a finger out of the window and asks the others, why is Kurt trying to drown Scotty? Both women whip their heads around to see Scott squirming out in the water. Jean instantly puts a telekinetic bubble around Scott and brings him back into the base. She just hopes that she is not too late and that the pressure didn't already crush his body. On the jet, Shatterstar struggles to make his way to Jean Grey. She pries in his mind to find out that someone, some things done this to him, filled his head with memories making him do this. They are trying to make Shatterstar kill her. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's confused. Warpath and Cannonball attempt to restrain Shatterstar, but he continues to flail about. Boom Boom creates her pocket-sized explosives and tosses the projectiles at Shatterstar, each of them detonating like miniature bombs. Still, he fights. In C. Rebro, member of X-Men Red, Trinary, and Jean examine Scott's body on the medical table. He's not dead. But he's not in good shape either. The water pressure could have crushed both him and Kurt. Speaking of, Nightcrawler continues to teleport around the Atlantean base. For now, he remains undetected by the women or the boy. He lies in wait for the right time. When their defenses are down, the perfect moment to kill the young mutant. Marvel Girl tries to shut down Shatterstar before it's too late, but his mind is gone. Kill the mutant, he chants unknowingly as he uses his weapons to tear apart the jet. Sam Guthrie, Cannonball, decides that he has had enough of this. He bursts forward. His legs turn to a propelling flame. His body turns nigh invulnerable as he tackles Shatterstar and breaks through the side of the jet. He will have to fight Shatterstar alone. In the mansion, the battle continues. The thunderous sound of Storm's lightning cannot keep Wolverine down for long, and they cannot drown out the screams of the students as the hounds break apart the building and take over their school. In the middle of it all stands Ahab. I only need one of you. Young Hank McCoy, give yourself up, and the others can walk away from this. But if you continue to run, then young Cyclops, Gene, Angel, or Bobby must take your place. Are you able to live with that, knowing that one of your teammates gave their lives because you were too cowardly to do the same for them? The young Hank McCoy continues to sprint on all fours down the corridors. Two hounds sprint after him, his older counterpart, just a hallway away. The older of the two, Beasts, closes in and is about to challenge the hounds himself, but they are shot in their tracks. Beast looks up, still holding his side to protect from blood loss, and sees the young Cable with a smoking gun. Cable then pulls out a second pistol and fires a tranquilizer into young Hank's neck at point-blank range. This 
is for your own good. Cable tells him. Body slide. Fight two. A blue portal opens up, absorbing Cable and young Hank. Beast continues to charge forward. He tries to stop them, but the portal closes, taking the two with it, and Beast slams into the wall behind them, cracking the remaining good ribs he has on his left side. Beast slides to the ground and leaves a bloody trail on the wall behind him. The first to find him is Headmaster Kitty Pride, the Shadow Cat. Beast catches her up on what he can before he passes out from his injuries. Ahab cackles before attempting to teleport him and his minions away. Hounds, we are done here. The hounds begin to glow blue and one by one, they teleport away. As the last of the hounds disappears, what is left of the X-Men team at the mansion? Kitty, Iceman, Storm, Rockslide, Armor, and Glob all just stand there with no real clue on what just happened. Iceman slides in demanding that Kitty tells him what happened to the younger Hank. She can lie if she has to. He just needs her to tell him they didn't get Hank too. Elsewhere, within Cable's hideout, a stasis chamber closes over the young Hank McCoy. Cable checks a number of different charts and readings off his computer. He calls it the Professor. He is pleased to see his machinations are coming to fruition. His concentration is then broken by the wails in agony coming from Mimic. Cable walks over to the railing and looks down to the bottom floor where Calvin Rankin is being hung up to the same machine that Cable used to remove Angel's modified wings. As per his power, Calvin's proximity to Angel allows him to grow wings of his own. Wings that Cable will gladly remove. Forcefully. The X-Force X-Wing is going down fast. Cannonball successfully got the now-possessed Shatterstar out of the aircraft, but he left the team with a breach in the hole the size of Minnesota. Domino tries her hardest to regain control of the vehicle and decides to come clean to Marvel Girl. Cable was important to all the members of X-Force. He trained most of them, raised some of them. Hell, him and Domino used to be an item. Domino knows Marvel Girl has already read each of their minds. So, it doesn't need to be said that X-Force doesn't plan on just sitting around while Cable's killer's still out there. X-Force doesn't do things the way the rest of the X-Men teams do. When they find the son of a bitch who killed Cable, there's no talking, no discussion, just a bullet to the brain. Unlike Domino, Boom Boom is more of a fan of explosives. Warpath would rather just slit the guy's throat. Really, it all depends on who gets to him first. It's going to get dirty. It's going to get ugly. And if Marvel Girl can't hang with that, if she's going to get in their way, then Domino would prefer to drop her off with the Avengers or whoever so they can babysit while X-Force takes care of business. Elsewhere, on the Pequod, Ahab's base of operations, 50,000 feet 
above New York. A possessed Nightcrawler teleports before Ahab to inform him of his accomplishments. Nightcrawler claims that he successfully left the young Cyclops at the bottom of the ocean. Surely, the boy must be dead by now. That is not good enough for Ahab. Assurances are not enough. Ahab wants the boy's body. Nightcrawler apologizes to his master, stating that the water pressure was too great. He had to leave before he was killed. Then you should have stayed and died with him. He turns to one of his hounds steering the airship. Set course for Cerebro. We will make sure that the job is done. What concerns Ahab the most, however, is what has become of Young Angel and Iceman. And now, the Young Beast. Where did they go, and why did the X-Men think Ahab had already taken them? Within Cable's laboratory, he has his computer, the Professor, expand the scan perimeter by two degrees longitude and latitude. Cable wants to make sure his computer can notify him of any anomalies before they reach the base. The computer quickly scans the area and immediately finds the time-displaced Jean Grey approaching the hideout. Within the next few seconds, X-Force breaks down the door. Back on Ahab's airship, they have just reached their destination. The ship soars high above the Atlantic, 2,500 meters above Cerebro. Ahab tells every hound in attendance to prepare to dive. The massive metal mechanism points downward until it crashes into the wall of water below. Ahab smirks as they approach the undersea X-Men base. Once we've confirmed the death of Cyclops, we can leave this miserable timeline and the real work of ridding the world of mutants can begin. In Central Park, New York, Cannonball touches down at the ruins of the Xavier Institute for Mutant Education and Outreach. Sam assumed that he now with the unconscious Shatterstar in his arms, would be the one with the story to tell. But Iceman explains to Cannonball that Ahab and his hounds just attacked. They came for young Hank, and in all the confusion, the X-Men lost him to the teenage Cable. Also, the twins that the young X-Men found, Maxime and Mannion, they were with Ahab. They turned Logan and Rachel into hounds, and turned them on the others. Cannonball drops Shatterstar to the ground to update the others on the situation with the X-Force. Apparently, the same thing that happened to Rachel and Logan happened to Shatterstar. He went crazy aboard the X-Wing and tried to kill the young Jean. It took a good half hour of punching the hell out of each other before Cannonball was able to knock his lights out and bring him to the mansion. Headmaster Kitty Pride tells Cannonball to drop Shatterstar off in the lab with Dr. Reyes and get ready to leave. Him, her, Iceman, Angel, and Storm are done playing defense. They're going after Ahab. In Cable's safe house, the X-Force attacks. Domino unloads the bullets in her pistol, and that causes Cable to die for cover. Boom Boom keeps him at bay using her explosives as cover fire when Domino runs out of bullets and needs to reload. Marvel Girl begs the two women to stop so that they can talk to Cable, but Domino isn't stopping until the kid is dead. Meanwhile, Warpath frees the captive mutants contained in the stasis chambers. 
Cable counterattacks as he jumps out from his cover and fires back his rifle. The last people Cable wanted to hurt are the X-Force. But now, they are forcing his hand. Marvel Girl becomes enraged and with a psychic pulse, freezes everyone and everything in midair, the unconscious captive mutants included. Marvel Girl tells everyone that they are not going to do this. They are not going to just run around shooting at each other. That's how they got into this situation in the first place. Now, they are going to talk, and Cable is going to tell them what the hell is going on. Marvel Girl wants to hear from Cable's own mouth why he killed his older counterpart. And he better talk fast. Because he wasn't doing his job, Cable scowls back. He's supposed to keep this timeline in order, squash any anomalies. Yet he gave you guys a pass. Let you stay even though he knew the dangers of doing so. Because he got soft, sentimental. And I didn't kill Cable. I am Cable. I just retired the older, less effective version. The same will happen to me one day. Domino calls bullshit. There is no way the Nathan they knew would do what this Cable has done. And that's why I did what I had to to stop him. To save every damn one of you. Cable turns to Marvel Girl. Ahab is here because one of you dies. Bobby Drake. Though, the truth is, it doesn't matter which one of you dies. Not to Ahab. All Ahab has to do is kill one. Either you, Cyclops, Angel, Iceman, or Beast. Just one. And he completely rewrites your history. You'll never be able to go back and fulfill the past in the way you're meant to. Put me down and I'll show you. Against Domino's better wishes, Marvel Girl complies. Cable answers this by removing the small telepathy blocking device from the back of his skull. Now, his defenses are down. This way, Marvel Girl can know for sure that he's telling the truth. Gene scans his mind and sees it all. The timeline where Ahab succeeds. As Marvel Girl takes it all in, Cable continues. You X-Men are so obsessed with fixing the future that you are willing to change the past without a thought of the consequences. Yet, it's not just the big battles that matter. It's the ripples in the pond. Every moment, every fight matters. And once you pull away one facet of the past, undo everything that one person has done, everything changes. And not for the better. Battles you'd won are now lost because you are no longer a whole. And those losses turn society against you in a way that is irreparable. Man turns against mutants sooner that gives an earlier, stronger rise to the Sentinel program. And then, the Reaver virus. That damns mutant kind. That brings about an earlier, deadlier end to the X-Men. All because you refuse to go back to the past. X-Force listens in disbelief as Cable tells them, this house of horrors that Boom Boom keeps calling Cable's base is the simplest solution he has to fix all the changes that have been made to the young X-Men. Cable can't exactly send Angel back with cosmic fire wings, 
Everything has to be the same as when the kids first left. Warren needed his original wings back. So, Cable took Mimics. After the initial removal of his wings, when he was still asleep, Cable showed Mimic a vision of things to come. And now, the copy mutant is surprisingly on board. Within Cerebro, 3,000 feet beneath the surface of the Atlantic Ocean, Jean Grey sits at the young Cyclops' bedside. He groans as he wakes up, and he isn't too sure what happened after his encounter with the possessed Nightcrawler. Jean tries to calm the boy, but is interrupted by Gabby Kinney, the clone of Laura Kinney, the all-new Wolverine, entering the room. Gabby warns Jean that there is something she needs to see. Someone is approaching the base. Not long after, Ahab, Rachel Summers, Nightcrawler, Old Man Logan, and the two French twins as well as the rest of Ahab's hounds teleport into the base. You know, he says as he raises his harpoon to Jean, there's something very poetic about having to take to the ocean to find my white whale. Thank you for giving my hunt the literary flair it needed. Hounds, find Cyclops and bring him to me. Jean orders her team to protect Scott at all costs. Wolverine pops her claws, warning Ahab that he is going to pay for what he did to Logan. Gabby, however, is the first one to attack. She goes straight for the French twins, Mannion and Maxime. Finally, she thinks, someone her own size to pick on. Maxime reels back. The young boy is clearly afraid of the indifferent look in Gabby's eyes. Mannion, on the other hand, steps forward to protect her brother. She grabs a hold of Gabby and instantly, Gabby is transformed into one of Ahab's hounds. She then turns her sights on Trinary, the mutant from India with technopathic powers. With most of their team slowly becoming converted, Gentle, the Wakandan mutant with the power to increase his muscle mass, grabs a hold of Laura Kinney and runs out to the next room. Elsewhere, the X-Men group from the mansion is on their way. Headmaster Kitty Pride makes a call to Jean Grey for an update. Kitty received the distress call and the team is speeding towards Cerebro now. Jean explains that Ahab has arrived and she is now well aware that the twins are causing the mutants to convert into his hounds so quickly. She has made attempts to reach into the twins' minds and shut them both down. But with all the havoc going on, it's a mess down there. Stopping the kids will take some time, but Jean isn't too sure how much more time they have left. Jean, Wolverine, and Gentle make it back into the med bay where Cyclops still resides. Wolverine slams the door behind her, stating that the barrier will only keep their enemies at bay for so long. Suddenly, Nightcrawler appears. He teleports into the room and lands on top of Cyclops, telling the boy that now there is no escape. This time, they will die together. But out of nowhere, Nightcrawler is shot in the chest. The taser cartridge sparks as it unleashes enough voltage to down the blue mutant. The X-Force have arrived. With young Cable, young Jean, young Bobby, and Mimic all in tow. To this, X-Men Red have some questions. But Marvel Girl tells her older counterpart that she will explain to everyone what's going on later. Jean, however, has already read her mind, as well as Cable's. What they need to do now is find a way 
to send the young mutants back in time. Amongst the discourse, Scott sits up from his medical bed and vows that he is not going to let Ahab get away again. Not after what he did to Bloodstorm. At that moment, Ahab blows a hole into the wall. Him and his horde of hounds slowly enter the room. Where I come from. The mutant plague is an epidemic. There's not a family that hasn't lost loved ones. A war that hasn't been fought because of mutants. And finally, finally, I am able to bring them to peace. Bring an end to the chaos. Ahab continues to approach the groups of X-Men. Cyclops has had enough. He lunges forward out of the bed and fires the most powerful optic blast he can muster. Ahab laughs and commends the young mutant. A valiant effort, Cyclops. But it's too little, too late. The battle is over, and you've lost. Even though he's being bathed in optic blasts, Ahab finds the strength to reel back his harpoon before launching it forward like a javelin. The weapon pierces through Cyclops' chest and sends him flying backwards until the force pins him against the wall. Cyclops' blood slowly drips from the tip of the harpoon to the floor, and the hero quickly begins to lose consciousness. It's quiet. Nothing in the room can be heard but the faint sounds of growling from Ahab's hungry hounds and the shuffling and mumbling of the young X-Men as they lower the body of Scott Summers. He is alive, barely. Boom Boom charges up a plasma orb. Domino readies her pistol and Wolverine pops her claws, preparing for revenge. Ahab turns his back on the mutants and descends into the ranks of his horde, stating, Oh, sweet child, don't you realize that you've already lost? But I am more than happy to stick around and kill a few more mutants for the sport of it. Feast, my hounds! Honey Badger, again, is the first to attack. She pops her claws and dives into the mutant ranks. Domino steps back, yelling that she is not going to be the one to kill Gabby. Meanwhile, the young X-Men and Cable lay Scott down on the ground. Starting with his hair, Scott begins to transform back into Mimic, and then he dies. This wasn't even his fight, Iceman comments. The young Hank McCoy examines the room and finds the real Scott Summers huddled in the corner covering his eyes. Scott explains that he doesn't know what's happening. Mimic just took his visor and ran off. Cable hands Cyclops his visor and explains the situation. He's gone. Ahab killed him, thinking it was you. He helps Cyclops to his feet. He bought us extra time. We need to go now. Cyclops stands his ground. 
He won't leave the X-Men. They won't leave the X-Men. The older Jean Grey, however, supports Cable's idea. Even she can't stop this. The twins are turning everyone they touch into hounds. They have already lost enough. Maybe Cable can just teleport the young ones away. Cable explains to Jean that he can't at this point. Ahab will be able to track them wherever they go. Then we fight! Cyclops bellows as he runs into the chaos. We fight for Bloodstorm and for Mimic! Cable draws his weapon and races after Cyclops. Before he gets too far, he turns to remind Jean that she is their only hope. The future's only hope. She needs to find a way to shut down the twins now. Across the room, the twins, Mannion and Maxime, convert one mutant after another into obedient hounds. They catch and force Boom Boom to attack the others of the X-Force. Next is Warpath, a strong addition to their ranks, they think, as they watch the warrior let out a battle cry into the air. But then, Headmaster Kitty Pride and the rest of the X-Men team from the mansion, Cannonball, Storm, Angel, Glob, Iceman, Granite, and Armor flood into the room. Jean warns them all to stay away from the twins. She doesn't know how, but they are turning the X-Men into hounds and they're being overwhelmed. Kitty hears this and tells her team to instead focus their efforts on Ahab. The undersea base rumbles from the battle within. Smoke, fire, and projectiles cloud the already cluttered air, separating the friends and allies. The older angel soars above it all to find his younger counterpart. They dive down together, tactically picking out the advancing hounds and dropping them elsewhere. Wolverine fights old man Logan. Blood spatters in every direction as they refuse to cease their berserker barrage. Marvel Girl and her older counterpart do what they can to stop Rachel Summers' bombardment of psychic energy. Domino screams out trying to reason with Warpath. When he refuses to listen, she aims her pistol between his eyes. The twins giggle as they convert Granite. Honey Badger is too much for Glob to handle, and it seems Armor is too much for the now-possessed Gentle as well. Cannonball crashes into Boom Boom in mid-air, stopping her from carpet bombing his allies. Cyclops and Cable take out Hounds one by one, and in the middle of it all, Storm attacks Ahab. Somehow, Ahab is able to catch Storm with an unexpected counterattack. Ahab barely misses the impalement with his harpoon. Instead, the side of the weapon slices Storm across the ribcage. Storm tries to distance herself, but the twins can see that their master is in need. Mannion rushes Storm and jumps on her back in order to start the conversion process. Storm's resistance is strong and too much for Mannion alone. The child calls out for her coward brother to help. Maxime sprints through the fire with his head down, apologizing to his sister before giving Storm the command. He orders the African goddess to destroy the mutants, for Ahab, for her new master, and master of all the hounds. Storm screams out as she conjures a massive amount of lightning out of sheer willpower. The bolts dance around the room, attacking each of the remaining mutants. Lightning hammers into the surrounding glass dome that houses them. The following sounds of thunder are deafening. Jean Grey puts up a psychic barrier to protect her 
and some of the others from the attack. Lightning strikes again and again, cracking the barrier. The swarm of hounds claw at the blockade, attempting to aid in any way they can. Armor attempts to scoop the hounds away, but this only attracts Storm's attention, and the weather goddess turns the full force of her attack on armor. The mental made mechanism crashes down into Jean's barrier, and the two psychic forces reverberate against each other. The two genes desperately try to piece together why they can't find a way to mentally shut down the twins. It shouldn't be this difficult. Of course you can't, Ahab chides. I trained my children in how to defend themselves against the great Jean Grey. So much of your life you spent turning young mutants into weapons against humanity. And yet, it is those very same weapons that will prove your undoing. I believe they call that poetic justice. Inside the psychic barrier, Kid Cable tells the young Marvel Girl in Cyclops it's time to go. Marvel Girl is adamant on staying where they are. She will not leave the X-Men to die, or worse, to live out the rest of their lives as hounds under Ahab's control. Cable grits his teeth and tells Marvel Girl, remember when you asked me, why? Why I didn't ask you willingly to go back to your own time? Why I've been trying to force you back? This is why! Because the future depends on you, yet you can't see past what's right in front of you. You looked inside my mind. You saw what the future looks like if you stay. You know how serious this is. Marvel Girl averts her gaze. If they just leave the X-Men to die, what sort of ramifications will that have? They can't clean up one mess just to create another. She claims the real Cable would understand that. Cyclops places a hand on her shoulder and tells her that Kid Cable is right. If them being in the present causes all of this, they have no other choice but to leave. So, Marvel Girl sends out the call. First, to the young Bobby Drake, Currently, him and his older counterpart are skating around the air, on their slides made of ice, dodging lightning and freezing hounds in their wake. Bobby doesn't want to leave. He can't go back to how it was before. Bobby, the older counterpart, looks at his younger self and gives him a hug. He makes the young Bobby promise. No matter what happens when he goes back, he finally lets himself be honest with, well, himself. Everything will sort itself out from there. Angel says his goodbyes to his younger counterpart as well. It's a short goodbye, but Warren already knows he'll make himself proud. All the young X-Men converge, and just before Cyclops can give the order, Old Man Logan attacks. He slashes at the young Bobby, chipping away at his icy exterior and tackles him out of the air. Cable turns on his heel and shoots a plasma bolt from his rifle. The fully charged burst of energy sends Old Man Logan flying in the opposite direction, pulling up pieces of the ground with him. That was too close. Cable warns the team. No more playing around. Time slide by six. The six children are coated in a blue light before a portal opens up and takes them all away. Ahab snarls. Damn it. He's taken them. He tells the twins, Maxime and Mannion, you two finished the X-Men. 
I'll take care of those damn kids. The villain's body illuminates with the same blue light that coated the children as he disappears into the time stream to track them down. Kid Cable and the young X-Men are transported to the front steps of the mansion. But, as Angel mentions, it doesn't look like the past. If some of the floating technological structures weren't enough, the fact that there are other students littering the mansion is a clear indication that they are indeed not in the correct time. Cable explains that before Ahab got them, the mutant twins, Mannion and Maxine, were students of Xavier's, just like their parents. Where we are in time is about five years before the end. They're still students. They're still good. At that moment, the sky begins to crack. The clouds darken and lightning bounces around the atmosphere. Ahab's massive airship appears, hovering just above the tree line. Its very presence causes the sea of green to bend at the knee. Cyclops turns to Jean and asks how quickly she can find the twins. Since they are the ones creating the hounds, they should be able to tell Jean how to undo it. And with any luck, the rest of them will try to buy her some time. It seems Ahab has already tracked them down. Jean sprints into the building and immediately finds Glob, Granite, and Shadowcat sitting on the sofa in the front room. Gasping for air, Jean asks the three where to find the twins. The three mutants are caught off guard. Last they checked, Jean was supposed to be on a mission, but they answer. The twins are in the kitchen, eating breakfast. Jean tiptoes into the kitchen and the kids see her, immediately deducing that the young Jean must be Ms. Gray's younger sister. The children are actually very welcoming. It doesn't take long for Maxime to explain that he is an empath. He can make people feel what he wants them to. Happy, sad, angry. But he prefers when people are happy. His sister, Mannion, on the other hand, can give people memories. And then she can control when they remember them. That is all very interesting, Jean tells them. But perhaps a demonstration is in order. Outside, Ahab attacks. He sends a wave of hounds at the young X-Men, leaving them with no choice but to defend themselves. Beast sprints on all fours, attacking one hound after the other. Angel carries Cyclops, and together they rain down a crimson blast like hellfire on their opponents. Bobby makes an ice slide and grabs a hold of Cable and they speed through the front yard of the mansion. Cable shoots everything in sight. Ahab sees this and catapults his harpoon, shattering the ice. He laughs. Look at little kid Cable, trying to play with the big boys. You're not half the man you'll grow to be, and even then, not half the man as me. Given some years, you would realize that running around is a fool's errand. Because now that I got you in my sights, I will follow you to the edge of time and keep pressing until I kill one of those sweet young X-Men. Cyclops wonders aloud 
How Ahab even found them. Cable picks himself off the ground. We were too close to him. At that proximity, Ahab can track my jumps. Focus on the ship. Without it, he can't jump through time. The two point and shoot at the airship in an attempt to knock it out of the air. The combined power of the crimson beams and plasma bolts easily break apart its outer armor. Reverse course! Reverse course! Ahab curses. Can't you morons see what they're trying to do? But it's too late. The airship begins to break apart in the air as it crashes to the ground below, leaving an explosion in its wake. Ahab cries out as his life's work burns down in front of him. Jean joins the group in awe of what she just saw. A couple of the other young mutants let out a small cheer. Cable readies his rifle and keeps his sights on the enemy. The fight's far from over. It's time for you to go. I'll deal with Ahab. Without his ship, he can't follow you. Gene, you know what you have to do, right? Gene locks eyes with Cable and nods her head. The original five begin to glow in the familiar blue light. Gene's last words to Cable or thank you for saving her and to tell him to stop messing around with time. Will do. Don't let me down, Jean. Cable tells her, time slide by five. The kids disappear and Cable turns back to Ahab. The enemy is already charging forward. What have you done, you petulant child? Ahab throws his harpoon, but Cable dodges it. Oh, you're mad. How do you think I feel? I'm the one who has to come back and clean up this time mess. Time slide by two. Ahab grabs Cable by the throat and slams him into the ground as the two are teleported back to the undersea mutant base. Only Gene, Iceman, and Angel remains standing against the now fallen allies. They've gone back! Cable grits out before drawing his pistol and shooting Ahab point blank with everything he has left in the clip. In the past, the original five appear in front of the Xavier School for gifted youngsters. They're finally home. The team goes inside the surprisingly empty house and remove their suits from the future to put on their more time-appropriate attire. Admittedly, they all feel pretty dumb. But for this to work, they have to wipe their memories and everything has to be just as it was when Beast appeared. They can't suspect anything has changed. The problem is, when Beast arrived, the young Hank McCoy was just about to quit the X-Men. Scott tries to comfort his friend, telling Hank that he needs them just as much as they need Hank. He'll be back. Privately, Scott asks Jean if wiping their memories is really the best course of action. She is confident that it is. Cable showed her the future. He showed her what would happen if they'd stayed. They need to do this. They need everything to be as it was. And they won't forget. Mannion taught Jean how to lock their memories away so they can be sprung later. As soon as the time loop is closed, their older selves will inherit their memories Cyclops then mentions Cable. Perhaps he was lying about the whole thing. Gene tells Scott that Cable wouldn't lie. He didn't just save the future. He did this for them. He did this for Scott. In the end, 
he's just a young boy who misses his father. In the present, Jean Grey is fighting off the possessed granite. The stone-skinned mutant hound hammers away at what little is left of the telepath's final psychic barrier. The twins cheer. It is time for Jean to join her allies and friends. Suddenly, the mutants are hit with a flood of memories, their younger counterparts' memories, and with them, the knowledge of how to beat the children. And with one last kickback of energy, Jean Grey overcomes the twins, knocking out the children and turning off their programmed possession. In the end, it was simple. The younger Jean beat the children, not by fighting, but by talking. With a simple gesture of kindness, the young Jean Grey was able to find out the twins' powers and how to turn them off. And now that their memories are one and the same, the problem they once had is not much of a problem at all. Across the room, the injured Ahab is dragged away by a couple of hounds and Rachel. Jean tries to call Rachel back, but she doesn't listen. Or rather, she can't listen. Rachel is still possessed. Then, the four of them, Rachel, Ahab, and the two hounds, are all coated with the familiar blue light before they teleport away. Sadly, Jean already understands. Rachel wasn't like the others. Her pain was real. Jean couldn't undo it. Cable tells Jean Ahab doesn't have his ship. He's stuck in the present. In his condition, he won't get far. It won't be long before Cable finds him. Jean smirks and compliments Cable, saying that he really is him. He really is her, Nathan. That's what I've been saying. Take care of Mannion and Maxime. They were good kids before Ahab, and now their future doesn't exist. They're out of time and need a home. I'll be seeing you, Red. Body slide by one. Several days later, there is a funeral for the X-Men's fallen allies. Cable, Mimic, and Rachel. Hope Summers takes it the worst. After the funeral, Jean, Hank, Bobby, and Warren visit a diner that they used to frequent when they were children. They still can't believe everything that has happened. It honestly feels good to take time and get together, having shakes like they used to. Beast apologizes to his friends, saying he should have known better than to mess with the time stream. Gene tells Hank not to worry. The important thing is that they are all together. Although, it is agreed that the occasion feels at least a little empty without Scott there. And so, the friends raise their glasses into the air as Jean proposes a toast to friends, both past and present, both here and gone. May they be with them always. And to Scott. Elsewhere, in another one of Cable's safe houses, Within an undisclosed location, the lights flicker on as he passes them. Small amounts of dust are kicked up with each step. He continues to walk down the corridor to a small mini-fridge humming in the back of the room. 
and removes a couple of drinks. It's done, Cable says, before turning down the walkway, leading to a man sitting alone at a table. Cable hands him the drink. The young X-Men are back in their own time. Ahab's mutant murder future isn't happening. Everything's the way it should be. It's finally time for you to come back, Dad. <laughs>